Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Chill Literacy. Happy Wednesday. It is not Halloween season anymore, but it was only yesterday, so we've kept the decorations up. Um, even though this is also not a spooky story. But, you know, why not? Spooky season. It's good times. Happy All Saints Day. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's also... Is it the Day of the Dead in um, Mexico? Am I right in saying? Dia de los Muertos, maybe? Uncontrollable mobs are quite scary, to be honest. Yeah, yes, this is true. Um, Andy Pants, yes, you have turned up bang on time. Uh, but yeah, welcome in, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, Parola. Hello, Lady Mephistopheles. Hello, Andy Pants. Anyone else I've missed? Um, but yeah, I hope we're all doing all doing well. Uh, sorry that your foot's um, hurting, Lady Mephistopheles. That sucks. But um, yeah, I hope that I hope that improves for you. But uh, you're reading a book for pleasure for the first time since the beginning of the year. Nice. That is that is good. Um, so you turn up for just the last part when you've missed the rest. But this one does have a very famous closing. It does indeed. I was literally just saying that to Sam. It's like it, it, it begins with one of the most famous quotes, ends also with one of the most famous quotes. But yes, welcome in and hello, Cat. I hope you are well. Um, any, the, yeah, it's never silly to turn up for however much of any of our stuff that uh, you can catch. Um, Sam is greeting everybody. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Um, Hi. Thanks. Sam is in the room. Sam is in the room. <gasps> I can feel a presence. Um, you heard that as un uncontrollable mods are quite scary. I mean, yes. Is the Sam in the room with you now? Unfortunately so. Um, he is an uncontrollable mod. Yeah. Surprise, Sam. Yeah. But yes, uh, we, we are finishing A Tale of Two Cities today finally um which is all very exciting um this might be I, I'll, I'll see how i go but this is we've only li we've literally got two chapters left um so i might possibly just do sort of a one and done without a break and then have a little bit of a chat about it afterwards but uh yeah we'll see we'll see how i go um i don't know if you can hear it is um yeah it's blowing a gale outside because it is storm Oh, what are we on? Storm Kieran, I think, now? I'm not entirely sure. We're going around the alphabet. Um, so, uh, yes, if you can hear rain on the windows and wind, then that is what that is. Um, which is all very, um, very atmospheric, I guess. Sam can hear it. Gosh, I'm surprised. <sighs> We're in for one of those. Okay. Um, but yes, I hope everybody is well. Just extra atmosphere. In Indeed, yes. Um, we we do like a bit of a bit of ambient. Oh, excuse me. Ambient um, rain and stuff for extra atmosphere. Um, yes. Did we have anything we needed to say before we get into reading? Um, uh, there will be no stream this Saturday. Apologies. Um, for Sam and I will be watching fireworks. Um, and yes, for, for the next, uh, next week should be as normal, but the, for me at least, um, but the couple of weeks after that will probably be pre-records from me if I can get things done in time, or it might be a bit sort of not entirely sure what's happening on a Wednesday just because I am out of the country, um, so yeah just keep keep your eyes peeled on like the discord and um twitter if anybody still uses that um and mastodon and all of that all of the places where we say stuff about streams um for yeah any any updates about what we're doing when um and if if the schedule is different um which it might well be um we now have a store for anyone who doesn't know, we talked about it last last Monday, last Monday, I think, um, where we, yes, we have started things. We have, I think, a bag, uh, a, a desk mat, a t-shirt and a 
hoodie or long sleeve t-shirt not entirely sure can't remember um with uh the wonderful majestic salads majestic art um of uh that wonderful um oh we have a sticker as well sticker of just the chilitracy logo um bag mat t-shirt sticker yeah um give us a beat no uh yes so we have that excellent little uh, vignette from dracula because we thought why not for spooky season uh spookily put some merch out in a spooky fashion Ooh. um but yes i hope everybody who who celebrates halloween had a nice halloween yesterday um i took a choir rehearsal that was spooky it wasn't but you know um sorry my brain has just gone Bleh. um so yes you know what should we should we continue with good old charlie dickens for those of you who uh you ate candy and watched a spooky movie excellent that is excellent oh no actually i like we 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 uh we started playing um slay the princess um black tabby games new what well, newish as you know it is new it came out fairly recently um uh it is very good we we started playing that yesterday and would strongly recommend for those of you especially for those of you who are enjoying our oh oh yeah we we've, we've enjoyed our um playthrough of scarlet hollow obviously we haven't finished the game but we have finished all the game that we can play for now but yeah for those of you who have been enjoying that um slay the princess strongly recommend lots of fun well fun hmm. um is dark um lots lots of content warnings for that um but uh yeah it's really really good and of course the art and the writing and the music oh oh it's all very very good they are fantastic black tabby uh so yeah that's what we did yesterday it's all very exciting dark and plenty of visceral gore yeah yeah and sound design as well with that mm uh would normally have gone for a night walk in the woods but you might have needed a boat yesterday yes it's been quite wet um it's been a little damp uh yes slay the princess is extremely well voice acted it is indeed um but yes we are continuing well finishing uh, a tale of two cities uh what has happened so far um our hero i hope you can hear the quotation marks in my voice uh, Charles Darnay decided that it would be the best idea if he went to fr Paris, to France, even though he's an emigre and uh, an ex-aristocrat. Um, and of course he got thrown in prison because they're not the best friends with those people at the moment, given that there's, you know, a revolution going on. Uh, so it was all like, oh, I'm in prison. Oh, well, that's fine. My father-in-law is like bezies with everyone he's like because he was an ex bastille prisoner so he's he's like he's like a good a good lad for the people um and uh so it's like oh he'll put in a good word for me and i'll get i'll get out and then he did for like an hour and then got put in again and it's all fine um and uh we have a uh, friend sydney carton who definitely doesn't very conveniently look like Charles Darnay at all and that hasn't been pointed out to us a lot um who possibly might maybe have just crept into the Bastille and gone ah you must escape I will chloroform you and you will be taken out and I will take your place and die that's currently where we're at it's all very exciting also thank you very much Ray Tracer for subscribing for 19 months good lord many months good time zone to you too lightning exactly you get the, the 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 subscriber lightning strike <laughs> um which again very appropriate for the weather i've got right now except we haven't got actual thunder and lightning but you know wind and rain that'll do um but yes yeah, so that's kind of where we are story wise um and yeah we've got subscribing very very subscribing very good um you've got snow Blimey. Okay. Yeah, it's not it's not cold enough here for that yet. It's been unseason unseasonably warm. Um so uh yeah. 
Um, but yes, if we are all sitting comfortably, if we all have some kind of beverage or snack, I don't know, whatever you want, um, blanket, candle, all the all the seasonal things that one is meant to have, um, then we shall continue with A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book three, chapter 14, The Knitting Done. In that same juncture of time when the 52 awaited their fate, Madame Defarge held darkly ominous counsel with the Vengeance and Jacques Three of the revolutionary jury. Not in the wine shop did Madame Defarge confer with these ministers, but in the shed of the wood sawyer, erst a mender of roads. The sawyer himself did not participate in the conference, but abided at a little distance, like an outer satellite who was not to speak until required, or to offer an opinion until invited. But our Defarge, said Jacques Three, is undoubtedly a good Republican, eh? There is no better, the voluble vengeance protested in her shrill notes, in France. Peace, little vengeance said Madame Defarge, laying her hand with a slight frown on her lieutenant's lips. Hear me speak. My husband, fellow citizen, is a good Republican and a bold man. He has deserved well of the Republic and possesses its confidence. But my husband has his weaknesses, and he is so weak as to relent towards this doctor. It is a great pity croaked Jacques Three, dubiously shaking his head, with his cruel fingers at his hungry mouth. It is not quite like a good citizen. It is a thing to regret. See you, said Madame. I care nothing for this doctor, I. He may wear his head or lose it, for any interest I have in him. It is all one to me. But the Evremond people are to be exterminated and the wife and child must follow the husband and father. She has a fine head for it, croaked Jacques Three. I have seen blue eyes and golden hair there, and they looked charming when Samson held them up. Ogre that he was, he spoke like an epicure. Madame Defarge cast down her eyes and reflected a little. The child also observed Jacques Three, with a meditative enjoyment of his words, has golden hair and blue eyes, and we seldom have a child there. It is a pretty sight. In a word, said Madame Defarge, coming out of her short abstraction, I cannot trust my husband in this matter. Not only do I feel since last night that I dare not confide to him the details of my projects, but also I feel that if I delay, there is, his, there is danger of his giving warning, and then they might escape. That must never be, croaked Jacques Three. No one must escape. We have not half enough as it is. We ought to have six score a day. In a word... Madame Defarge went on. My husband has not my reason for pursuing this family to, her nut to annihilation, and I have not his reason for regarding this doctor with any sensibility. I must act for myself, therefore. Come hither, little citizen. The wood sawyer, who held her ear, who, sorry, who held her in the respect and himself in the submission of mortal fear advanced with his hand to his red cap. Touching those signals, little citizen, said Madame Defarge sternly, that she made to the prisoners, you are ready to bear witness to them this very day? Aye, aye, why not? cried the sawyer. Every day in all weathers from two to four, always signalling, sometimes with the little one, sometimes without. I know what I know. I have seen with my eyes. He made all manner of gestures while he spoke, as if in incidental imitation of some few of the great diversity of signals that he had never seen. "'Clearly plots,' said Jacques Three, transparently. 
There is no doubt of the jury? inquired Madame Defarge, letting her eyes turn to him with a gloomy smile. Rely on the patriotic jury, dear citizeness. I answer for my fellow jurymen. Now, let me see, said Madame Defarge, pondering again. Yet once more, can I spare this doctor to my husband? I have no feeling either way. Can I spare him? He would count as one head, observed Jacques Three in a low voice. We really have not heads enough. It would be a pity, I think. He was signalling with her when I saw her, argued Madame Defarge. I cannot speak of one without the other, and I must not be silent and trust the case wholly to him, this little citizen here, for I am not a bad witness. The vengeance and Jacques Three vied with each other in their fervent protestations that she was the most admirable and marvellous of witnesses. The little citizen, not to be outdone, declared her to be a celestial witness. He must take his chance, said Madame Defarge. No, I cannot spare him. You are engaged at three o'clock. You are going to see the batch of today executed. You? The question was addressed to the wood sawyer, who hurriedly replied in the affirmative, seizing the occasion to add that he was the most ardent of Republicans, and he would be, in effect, the most desolate of Republicans if anything prevented him from enjoying the pleasure of smoking his afternoon pipe in the contemplation of the droll national barber. He was so very demonstrative herein that he might have been suspected perhaps was by the dark eyes that looked contemptuously at him out of Madame Defarge's head, of having his small individual fears for his own personal safety every hour in the day. I, said Madame, am equally engaged at the same place. After it is over, say at eight to-night, come you to me in Saint-Antoine, and we will give information against these people at my section. The wood sawyer said he would be proud and flattered to attend the citizeness. The citizeness, looking at him, he became embarrassed, evaded her glance as a small dog would have done, retreated among his wood, and hid his confusion over the handle of his saw. Madame Defarge beckoned the jurymen and the vengeance a little nearer to the door, and there expounded her further views to them thus. She will now be at home, awaiting the moment of his death. She will be mourning and grieving. She will be in a state of mind to impeach the justice of the Republic. She will be full of sympathy with its enemies. I will go to her. What an admirable woman! What an adorable woman! exclaimed Jacques Three rapturously. Ah, my cherished! cried the vengeance and embraced her. Take you my knitting, said Madame Defarge, placing it in her lieutenant's hands, and have it ready for me in my usual seat. Keep me my usual chair. Go you there straight, for there will probably be a greater concourse than usual today. I willingly obey the orders of my chief, said the vengeance with alacrity, and kissing her cheek. You will not be late. I shall be there before the commencement. And before the tumbrils arrive, be sure you are there, my soul, said the vengeance, calling after her, for she had already turned into the street. Before the tumbrils arrive! Madame Defarge slightly waved her hand to imply that she heard and might be relied upon to arrive in good time, and so went through the mud and round the corner of the prison wall. The vengeance and the jurymen, looking after her as she walked away, were highly appreciative of her fine figure and her superb moral endowments. There were many women at that time, upon whom the time laid a dreadfully disfiguring hand, but there was not one among them to, more to be dreaded than this ruthless woman, now taking her way along the streets. Of a strong and fearless character, 
of shrewd sense and readiness, of great determination, of that kind of beauty which not only seems to impart to its possessor firmness and animosity, but to strike into others an instinctive recognition of those qualities. The troubled time would have heaved her up under any circumstances. But, imbued from her childhood with a brooding sense of wrong and an inveterate hatred of a class, opportunity had developed her into a tigress. She was absolutely without pity. If she had ever had the virtue in her, it had quite gone out of her. It was nothing to her that an innocent man was to die for the sins of his forefathers. She saw not him, but them. It was nothing to her that his wife was to be made a widow and his daughter an orphan. That was insufficient punishment, because they were her natural enemies and her prey, and as such had no right to live. To appeal to her was made hopeless by her having no sense of pity, even for herself. If she had been laid low in the streets, in any of the many encounters in which she had been engaged, she would not have pitied herself. Nor if she had been ordered to the axe tomorrow would she have gone to it with any softer feeling than a fierce desire to change places with the man who sent her there. Such a heart Madame Defarge carried under her rough robe. Carelessly worn, it was, be it was a becoming robe enough in a certain weird way, and her dark hair looked rich under her coarse red cap. Lying hidden in her bosom was a loaded pistol. Lying hidden at her waist was a sharpened dagger. Thus accoutred, and walking with the confident tread of such a character, and with the supple freedom of a woman who had habitually walked in her girlhood barefoot and bare-legged on the brown sea sand, Madame Defarge took her way along the streets. Now, when the journey of the travelling coach, at that very moment waiting for the completion of its load, had been planned out last night, the difficulty of taking Miss Pross in it had much engaged Mr Lorry's attention. It was not merely desirable to avoid overloading the coach, but it was of the highest importance that the time occupied in examining it and its passengers should be reduced to the utmost, since their escape might depend on the saving of only a few seconds here and there. Finally, he had proposed, after anxious consideration, that Miss Pross and Jerry, who were at liberty to leave the city, should leave it at three o'clock in the lightest wheeled conveyance known to that period. Unencumbered with luggage, they would soon overtake the coach, and, passing it and preceding it on the road, would order its horses in advance and greatly facilitate its progress during the precious hours of the night, when delay was the most to be dreaded. Seeing in this arrangement the hope of rendering real service in that pressing emergency, Miss Pross hailed it with joy. She and Jerry had beheld the coach start, had known who it was that Solomon brought, had passed some ten minutes in tortures of suspense, and were now concluding their arrangements to follow the coach, even as Madame Defarge, taking her way through the streets, now drew nearer and nearer to the else-deserted lodging in which they held their consultation. "'Now, what do you think, Mr Cruncher?' said Miss Pross, whose agitation was so great that she could hardly speak or stand or move or live. "'What do you think of our not starting from this courtyard? Another carriage having already gone from here today, it might awaken suspicion.' "'My opinion, Miss,' returned Mr. Cruncher, is as you're right. Likewise, what I'll stand by you, right or wrong. I am so distracted with fear and hope for our precious creatures, said Miss Pross, wildly crying, that I am incapable of forming any plan. Are you capable of forming any plan, my dear good Mr. Cruncher? Respect in a future sphere of life, Miss, returned Mr. Cruncher. I hope so. 
Respecting any present use of this here blessed old head of mine, I think not. Would you do me the favour, miss, to take notice of two promises and wows what it is my wishes for to record in this here crisis? Oh, for gracious sake, cried Miss Pross, still wildly crying. Record them at once and get them out of the way, like an excellent man. First, said Mr Cruncher, who was all in a tremble and who spoke with an ashy and solemn visage, let them them poor things well out of this. Never no more will, will I do it. Never no more. I am quite sure, Mr Cruncher, returned Miss Pross, that you never will do it again, whatever it is, and I beg you not to think it necessary to mention more particularly what it is. No, Miss, returned Jerry. It shall not be named to you. Second, them poor things well out of this, and never no more will I interfere with Mrs Cruncher's flopping. Never no more. W whatever housekeeping arrangement that may be, said Miss Pross, striving to dry her eyes and compose herself, I have no doubt it is best that Mrs Cruncher should have it entirely under her own superintendence. Oh, my poor darlings! I go so far as to say, Miss Moore Hover, proceeded Mr Cruncher, with a most alarming tendency to hold forth as from a pulpit, and let my words be took down and took to Mrs Cruncher through yourself, that what my opinions respecting flopping has undergone a change, and that what I only hope with my, all my heart as Mrs Cruncher may be a flopping at the present time. There, 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 I, I hope she is, my dear man cried the distracted Miss Pross, and I hope she finds it answering her expectations. Forbid it, proceeded Mr Cruncher, with additional solemnity, additional slowness, and additional tendency to hold forth and hold out, as anything what I have ever said or done should be visited on my earnest wishes for them poor creatures now. Forbid it, as we shouldn't all flop, if it was anyways convenient to get him out of here this dismal risk uh, get him out of this here dismal risk forbid it miss what i say forbid it this was mr cruncher's conclusion after a protracted but vain endeavour to find a better one and still madame defarge pursuing her way along the streets came nearer and nearer. "'If we ever get back to our native land,' said Miss Pross, "'you may rely upon my telling Mrs Cruncher "'as much as I may be able to remember "'and understand of what you have so impressively said. <clears throat> "'And at all events you may be sure "'that I shall bear witness to your being thoroughly in earnest "'at this dreadful time. Uh, "'Now, pray, let us think, my esteemed Mr Cruncher, "'let us think!' Still, Madame Defarge, pursuing her way along the streets, came nearer and nearer. "'If you were to go before,' said Miss Pross, "'and stop the vehicle and horses from coming here, "'and were to wait somewhere for me, wouldn't that be best?' "'Mr Cruncher thought it might be best. "'Where could you wait for me?' asked Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher was so bewildered that he could think of no locality but Temple Bar. Alas, Temple Bar was hundreds of miles away, and Madame Defarge was drawing very near indeed. "'By the cathedral door,' said Miss Pross, "'would it be much out of the way to take me in near the great cathedral door between the two towers?' "'No, miss,' answered Mr. Cruncher. Then, like the best of men, said Miss Pross, go to the posting house straight and make that change. I am doubtful, said Mr Cruncher, hesitating and shaking his head, about leaving of you, you see. We don't know what may happen. Heaven knows we don't, returned Miss Pross, but have no fear for me. Take me in at the cathedral at three o'clock, or as near it as you can, and I am sure it will be better than our going from here. I feel certain of it. There, bless you, Mr Cruncher. Think not of me, but of the lives that may depend on both of us. 
This exordium, and Miss Pross's two hands in quite agonised entreaty clasping his, decided Mr Cruncher. With an encouraging nod or two, he immediately went out to alter the arrangements, and left her by herself to follow as she had proposed. The having originated a precaution which was already in course of execution was a great relief to Miss Pross. The necessity of her of composing her appearance so that it should attract no special attent notice in the streets was another relief. She looked at her watch, and it was twenty minutes past two. She had no time to lose, but must get ready at once. Afraid, in her extreme perturbation, of the loneliness of the deserted rooms and of half-imagined faces peeping from behind every open door in them, Miss Pross got a basin of cold water and began lav laving her eyes, which were swollen and red. Haunted by her feverish apprehensions, she could not bear to have her sight obscured for a minute at a time by the dripping water, but constantly paused and looked round to see that there was no one watching her. In one of those pauses, she recoiled and cried out, for she saw a figure standing in the room. The basin fell to the ground, broken, and the water flowed to the feet of Madame Defarge. By strange stern ways and through much staining blood, those feet had come to meet that water. Madame Defarge looked coldly at her and said, The wife of Evremonde, where is she? It flashed upon Mrs. Miss Pross's mind that the doors were all standing open and would suggest the flight. Her first act was to shut them. There were four in the room and she shut them all. She then placed herself before the door of the chamber which Lucy had occupied. Madame Defarge's dark eyes followed her through this rapid movement and rested on her when it was finished. Miss Pross had nothing beautiful about her. Years had not tamed the wildness or softened the grimness of her appearance. But she, too, was a determined woman in her different way, and she measured Madame Defarge with her eyes every inch. "'You might, from your appearance, be the wife of Lucifer,' said Miss Pross in her breathing. "'Nevertheless, you shall not get the better of me. I am an Englishwoman.' Madame Defarge looked at her, excuse me, looked at her scornfully, but still with something of Miss Pross's own perception that they too were at bay. She saw a tight, hard, wiry woman before her, as Mr Lorry had seen in the same figure a woman with a strong hand in the years gone by. She knew full well that Miss Pross was the family's devoted friend. Miss Pross knew full well that Madame Defarge was the family's malevolent enemy. On my way yonder, said Madame Defarge, with a slight movement of her hand towards the fatal spot, where they reserve my chair and my knitting for me, I am com come to make my compliments to her in passing. I wish to see her. I know that your intentions are evil, said Miss Pross, and you may depend upon it, I'll hold my own against them. Each spoke her own language. Neither understood the other's words. Both were very watchful and intent to deduce from look and manner what the unintelligible words meant. "'It will do her no good to keep herself concealed from me at this moment,' said Madame Defarge. "'Good patriots will know what that means. "'Let me see her. "'Go tell her that I wish to see her. "'Do you hear?' If those eyes of yours were bedwinches, returned Miss Pross, and I was an English four-poster, they shouldn't loose a splinter of me. No, you wicked foreign woman, I am your match. 
Madame Defarge was not likely to follow these idiom idiomatic remarks in detail, but she so far understood them as to perceive that she was set at naught. Woman imbecile and pig-like, said Madame Defarge, frowning. I take no answer from you. I demand to see her. Either tell her that I demand to see her, or stand out of the way of the door and let me go to her. This with an angry explanatory wave of her right arm. I little thought, said Miss Pross, that I should ever want to understand your nonsensical language, but I would give all I have, except the clothes I wear, to know whether you suspect the truth or any part of it. Neither of them, for a single moment, released the other's eyes. Madame Defarge had not moved from the spot where she stood when Miss Pross first became aware of her, but she now advanced one step. "'I am a Briton,' said Miss Pross. "'I am desperate. I don't care an English tuppence for myself. I know that the longer I keep you here, the greater hope there is for my ladybird.' I'll not leave a handful of that dark hair upon your head if you lay a finger on me. Thus Miss Pross, with a shake of her head and a flash of her eyes between every rapid sentence and every rapid sentence a whole breath, thus Miss Pross, who had never struck a blow in her life. But her courage was of that emotional nature that it brought the irrepressible tears into her eyes, this was a courage that Madame Defarge so little comprehended as to mistake for weakness. Ha! <laughs> she laughed. You poor wretch! What are you worth? I address myself to that doctor. Then she raised her voice and called out, Citizen doctor, wife of Evremond, child of Evremond, any person but this miserable fool, answer the citizeness Defarge. Perhaps the following silence, perhaps some latent disclosure in the expression of Miss Pross's face, perhaps a sudden misgiving, a misgiving apart from either suggestion, whispered to Madame Defarge that they were gone. Three of the doors she opened swiftly and looked in. Those rooms are all in disorder. There has been hurried packing. There are odds and ends upon the ground. There is no one in that room behind you. Let me look. Never, said Miss Pross, who understood the request as perfectly as Madame Defarge understood the answer. If they are not in that room, they are gone and can be pursued and brought back, said Madame Defarge to herself. As long as you don't know whether they are in that room or not and you are uncertain what to do, said Miss Pross to herself, and you shall not know that if I can prevent your knowing it. And know that or not know that, you shall not leave here while I can hold you. I have been in the streets from the first. Nothing has stopped me. I will tear you to pieces, but I will have you from that door, said, uh, said Madame Defarge. We are, at the, we are alone at the top of a high house in a solitary courtyard. We are not likely to be heard, and I pray for bodily strength to keep you here, while every minute you are here is worth a hundred thousand guineas to my darling, said Miss Pross. Madame Defarge made at the door. Miss Pross, on the instinct of the moment, seized her round the waist in both her arms and held her tight. It was in vain for Madame Defarge to struggle and to strike. Miss Pross, with the vigorous tenacity of love, always so much stronger than hate, clasped her tight and even lifted her from the floor in the struggle that they had. The two hands of Madame Defarge buffeted and tore her face, but Miss Pross, with her head down, held her round the waist and clung to her with more than the hold of a drowning woman. Soon, Madame Defarge's hands ceased to strike and felt at her encircled waist. It is under my arm, said Miss Pross in smothered tones. You shall not draw it. I am stronger than you, I bless heaven for it. 
I hold you till one or other of us faints or dies. Madame Defarge's hands were at her bosom. Miss Pross looked up, saw what it was, struck at it, struck out a flash and a crash, and stood alone, blinded with smoke. All this was in a second. As the smoke cleared, leaving an awful stillness, it passed out on the air, like the soul of the furious woman whose body lay lifeless on the ground. In the first fright and horror of her situation, Miss Pross passed the body as far from it as she passed the body as far from it as she could, and ran down the stairs to call for fruitless help. Happily, she bethought herself of the consequences of what she did, in time to check herself and go back. It was dreadful to go in at the door again, but she did go in, and even went near it to get the bonnet and and other things that she must wear. These she put on, out on the staircase, first shutting and locking the door and taking away the key. She then sat down on the stairs a few moments to breathe and to cry, and then got up and hurried away. By good fortune she had a veil on her bonnet, or she could hardly have gone along the streets without being stopped. By good fortune, too, she was naturally so peculiar in appearance as to not show disfigurement like any other woman. She needed both advantages, for the marks of griping fingers were deep in her face, and her hair was torn, and her dress, hastily composed with unsteady hands, was clutched and dragged a hundred ways. In crossing the bridge, she dropped the door key in the river. Arriving at the cathedral some few minutes before her escort, and waiting there, she thought, what if the key were already taken in a net? What if it were identified? What if the door were opened and the remains discovered? What if she were stopped at the gate, sent to prison and charged with murder? In the midst of these fluttering thoughts, the escort appeared, took her in, and took her away. Is there any noise in the streets? she asked him. The usual noises, Mr. Cruncher replied, and looked surprised by the question and by her aspect. I, I don't hear you, said Miss Pross. What do you say? It was in vain for Mr. Cruncher to repeat what he said. Miss Pross could not hear him. So I'll nod my head, thought Miss Mr. Cruncher, amazed. At all events she'll see that. And she did. "'Is there any noise in the streets now?' asked Miss Pross again, presently. Again Mr. Cruncher nodded his head. "'I don't hear it.' "'Gone deaf in an hour?' said Mr. Cruncher, ruminating, with his mind much disturbed. "'What's come to her?' "'I feel,' said Miss Pross, as if there had been a flash and a crash, and that crash was the last thing I should ever hear in this life. Blessed if she ain't in a queer condition, said Mr. Cruncher, more and more disturbed. What can she have been a-taking to keep her courage up? Hark! There's the roll of them dreadful carts. You can hear that, miss. I, I can hear said Miss Pross, seeing that he spoke to her. Nothing. Oh, my good man, there was first a great crash, and then a great stillness, and that stillness seems to be fixed and unchangeable, never to be broken any more as long as my life lasts. If she don't hear the roll of those dreadful carts, now very nigh their journey's end, said Mr. Cruncher, glancing over his shoulder. It's my opinion that indeed she never will hear anything else in this world. And indeed, she never did. Chapter 15 The footsteps die out forever. 
Along the Paris streets, the, de the death carts rumble, hollow and harsh. Six tumbrils carry the day's wine to La Guillotine. All the devouring and insatiate, insatiate monsters imagined since imagination could record itself are fused in the one realization, guillotine. And yet there is not in France, with its rich variety of soil and climate, a blade, a leaf, a root, a sprig, a peppercorn, which will grow to maturity under conditions more certain than those that have produced this horror. Crush humanity out of shape once more under similar hammers, and it will twist itself into the same tortured forms. So the same seed of rapacious license and oppression over again, and it will surely yield the same fruit according to its kind. Six tumbrils roll along the streets. Change these back again to what they were, thou powerful enchanter, time, and they shall be seen to be the carriages of absolute monarchs, the equipages of feudal no nobles, the toilettes of flaring Jezebels, the churches that are not my father's house but dens of thieves, the huts of millions of starving peasants. No, the great magician who majestically works out the appointed order of the Creator never reverses his transformations. If thou be changed into this shape by the will of God, say the seers to the enchanted in the wise Arabian stories, then remain so. But if thou wear this form through mere passing conjuration, then resume thy former aspect. Changeless and hopeless, the tumbrils roll along. As the sombre wheels of the six carts go round, they seem to plough up a long, crooked furrow among the populace in the streets. Ridges of faces are thrown to this side and to that, and the ploughs go steadily onward. So used are the regular inhabitants of the houses to the spectacle, that in many windows there are no people, and in some the occupation of the hands is not so much as suspended while the eyes survey the faces in the tumbrils. Here and there, the inmate has visitors to see the sight. Then he points his finger, with something of the complacency of a curator or authorised exponent, to this cart and to this, and seems to tell who sat here yesterday and who there the day before. Of the riders in the tumbrils, some observe these things, and all things on their last roadside with an impassive stare, others with a lingering interest in the ways of life and men. Some, seated with drooping heads, are sunk in silent despair. Again, there are some so heedful of their looks that they cast upon the multitude such glances as they have seen in theatres and in pictures. Several close their eyes and think, or try to get their straying thoughts together. Only one, and he a miserable creature, of a crazed aspect, is so shattered and made drunk by horror that he sings and tries to dance. Not one of the whole number appeals by look or gesture to the pity of the people. There is a guard of sundry horsemen riding abreast of the tumbrils, and faces are often turned up to some of them, and they are asked some question. It would seem to be always the same question, for it is always followed by a press of people towards the third cart. The horsemen abreast of that cart frequently point out one man in it with their swords. The leading curiosity is to know which is he, he stands at the back of the tumbril with his head bent down to converse with a mere girl who sits on the side of the cart and holds his hand. He has no curiosity or care for the scene about him and always speaks to the girl. Here and there in the long street of Saint-Honoré, 
cries are raised against him. If they move him at all, it is only to a quiet smile as he shakes his hair a little more loosely about his face. He cannot easily touch his face, his arms being bound. On the steps of a church, awaiting the coming up of the tumbrils, stands the spy and prison sheep. He looks into the first of them, not there. He looks into the second, not there. He already asks himself, has he sacrificed me? When his face clears as he looks into the third. Which is Evremond? says a man behind him. That, at the back there. With his hand in the girl's? Yes. The man cries, Down, Evremond! To the guillotine, all ast aristocrats! Down, Evremond! Hush, hush. The spy entreats him timidly. And why not, citizen? He is going to pay the forfeit. It will be paid in five minutes more. Let him be at peace. But the man continuing to exclaim, Down, Evremond! The face of Evremond is for a moment turned towards him. Evremond then sees the spy and looks attentively at him and goes his way. The clocks are on the stroke of three and the furrow ploughed among the populace is turning round to come on into the place of execution and end. The ridges thrown to this side and to that now crumble in and close behind the last plough as it passes on, for all are following to the guillotine. In front of it, seated in chairs, as in a garden of public diversion, are a number of women, busily knitting. On one of the foremost chairs stands the Vengeance, looking about for her friend. Therese! She cries in her shrill tones. Who has seen her? Therese de Farge? She never missed before, says a knitting woman of the sisterhood. No, nor will she miss now, cries the vengeance petulantly. Therese? Louder, the woman recommends. Aye, louder, vengeance, much louder, and still she will scarcely hear thee. Louder yet, vengeance, with a little oath or so added, and yet it will hardly bring her. Send other women, women up and down to seek her, lingering somewhere, and yet, although the messengers have done dread deeds, it is questionable whether of their own wills they will go far enough to find her. Bad fortune, cries the vengeance, stamping her foot in the chair, and here are the tumbrils, and Evremond will be dispatched in a wink, and she not here. See her knitting in my hand, and her empty chair ready for her. I cry with vexation and disappointment. As the vengeance descends from her elevation to do it, the tumbrils begin to discharge their loads. The ministers of Saint Guillotine are robed and ready. Crash! A head is held up and the knitting women, who scarcely lifted their eyes to look at it a moment ago when it could think and speak, count one. The second tumbril empties and moves on. The third comes up. Crash! And the knitting women, never faltering or pausing in their work, count two. The supposed... Evremond descends, and the seamstress is lifted out next after him. He has not relinquished her patient hand in getting out, but still holds it as he promised. He gently places her with her back to the crashing engine that constantly whirs up and falls, and she looks into his face and thanks him. But for you, dear stranger, I should not be so composed for I am naturally a poor little thing, faint of heart. Nor should I have been able to raise my thoughts to him who was put to death, that we might have hope and comfort here today. I think you were sent to me by heaven. 
All you to me, says Sidney Carton. Keep your eyes upon me, dear child, and mind no other object. I mind nothing while I hold your hand. I shall mind nothing when I let it go, if they are rapid. They will be rapid, fear not. The two stand in the fast thinning throng of victims, but they speak as if they were alone. Eye to eye, voice to voice, hand to hand, heart to heart, these two children of the universal mother, else so wide apart and differing, have come together on the dark highway to repair home together and to rest in her bosom. Brave and generous friend, will you let me ask you one last question? I am very ignorant and it troubles me just a little. Tell me what it is. I have a cousin, an only relative and an orphan, like myself, whom I love very dearly. She is five years younger than I, and she lives in a farmer's house in the South Country. Poverty parted us, and she knows nothing of my fate, for I cannot write. And if I could, how should I tell her? It is better as it is. Yes, yes, better as it is. What I have been thinking as we came along, and what I am still thinking now, as I look into your kind, strong face which gives me so much support, is this. If the Republic really does good to the poor, and if they come to be less hungry, and in all ways to suffer less, she may live a long time. She may even live to be old. What then, my gentle sister? Do you think... The uncomplaining eyes in which there is so much endurance fill with tears and the lips part a little more and tremble. That it will seem long to me while I wait for her in the better land where I trust both you and I will be mercifully sheltered. It cannot be, my child. There is no time there and no trouble there. You comfort me so much. I am so ignorant. Am I to kiss you now? Is the moment come? Yes. She kisses his lips. He kisses hers. They solemnly bless each other. The spare hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet, bright constancy is in the patient face. She goes next before him is gone. The knitting women count twenty-two. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The murmuring of many voices, the upturning of many faces, the pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd so that it swells forward in a mass like one great heave of water all flashes away. 23 They said of him about the city that night that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers by the same axe, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold, not long before, to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had, been, if he had given any utterance to his, and they were prophetic, they would have been these. I see Barsad and Cly, Defarge, the Vengeance, the Juryman, the Judge, long ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old, perishing by this retributive instrument. 
before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city and a brilliant people rising from this abyss, and in their struggles to be truly free, in their triumphs and defeats through long, long years to come, I see the evil of this time and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth, gradually making expiation for itself and wearing out. I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous and happy, in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom, who bears my name. I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored, and faithful to all men in his healing office, and at peace. I see the good old man, so long their friend, in ten years' time enriching them with all he has, and passing tranquilly to his reward. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts, and in the hearts of their descendants, generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed. And I know that each was not more honoured and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. I see that child who lay upon her bosom and who bore my name, a man winning his way up in that path of life which once was mine. I see him winning it so well that my name is made illustrious there by the light of his. I see the blots I threw upon it faded away. I see him, foremost of just judges and honoured men, bringing a boy of my name, with a forehead that I know and golden hair, to this place, then fair to look upon, with not a trace of this day's disfigurement. And I hear him tell the child my story, with a tender and a faltering voice. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. The End Thank you for listening. Yeah, that last bit is some feels. And I think Sam needs to have a coughing fit in the background there. It's <laughs> fine. Oh, sorry, Thunder, you came in just for the end there. But uh, thank you very much for the resub for 26 months. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, I, I just about held it together in that last bit because it's, again, like it begins, this is such a quotable book and it begins with an absolute fantastic quote and it ends with a, oof, another fantastic quote that whole last chapter was absolutely marvelously written yeah it was just digging dickens writes well so well it's the the thing that i particularly like is the numbers the counting of the deaths at the guillotine and like it's you were dealing with how learning how to do a mod thing Ooh, well i hope you have learned and it was fun to learn. <laughs> no, no need to apologise for being late, Thunder. You, a Thunder arrives precisely when uh, Z means to. Um, Dickens is one of those people where you can see him absolutely transparently manipulating your emotions and it still works. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, there's a, again, there's a reason, there's a reason his stuff is meant to be read out loud. It's because it's, it is, it's theatre, it's drama, and it, it bloody works. It really does. Just the whole, like, the fact that you see the last bit of Carton's life from his eyes. Like, he sees all these people suddenly, like, cramming in to see him die. And then it's gone. And then you've just got 23. Just the cold number. Um, and, yeah, it's it's good. 
And again, like, yeah, Madame Defarge is not a nice person and is just, yeah, just cold and cold hearted. But you can understand why she is like she is. You can understand why everybody was the way they were. I mean, mass hysteria does a lot. But yeah, like she was, she felt completely justified in f seeking vengeance for her family and she didn't get that vengeance. She didn't get to see it come to fruit. What, well, well, what she thought was come to fruition, and in a way, that's kind of sad for her too. No one does well out of this, apart from our heroes, because good old Sidney Carlton sacrificed himself. Um, but yeah, Miss Pross is an absolute bloody legend. Um, and again, like that whole section, like people always think. And I know we've had this discussion before, but like people always think Dickens is so wordy all the time. He takes such a long time to get to the point and all of that stuff. And it's like, no, no, Dickens writes things. Dickens writes snappy stuff like that. That whole sort of action sequence, as it were, it is great. Like she's, yeah, just suddenly the gun goes off. Um, and yeah, like the 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 bit that I think. I feel sad. Well, I, I guess I feel sad for Sidney Carton, obviously, but the the bit I feel saddest about is the fact that she she gets deafened by by the gunshot, um, and she's just constantly asking, "Is there noise? Is there noise?" And it's like, oof, yeah, that that's 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 sad. That's awful. Um, just yeah, she she's a legend. Um, I do, I do also love the kind of slight black comedy, dark comedy in that section of they're both shouting at each other in languages that neither of them understand. Um, it's like, if I shout at you long enough, you'll get the gist, right? Um, but like, yeah, she's, she's, she's kind of the hero of that, of that bit. Um, yeah, it's a good book. Dickens, Dickens is a good author. That's what happens when you get paid by the word, I guess. Yeah, true, but he's—I—I I, I don't know. I—I I think a, a lot of a lot of Dickens gets a bit of a bad rep just just because people think he's wordy, but actually he's—he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, it's not like as Sam has found with Poe. It's not like he just—it feels. I know he luxuriates in the language. Yes, exactly, but it doesn't feel pretentious necessarily. Um, Poe feels a bit, ooh, look at me, I'm using lots of fun words and things. Like, Dickens makes up words, for God's sake. But Dickens, like, Dickens is very good at sort of taking you on a journey and then giving you a punchline, quite frankly. Um, like, he's good at that. You enjoyed it a lot more this time. First time you read it by yourself, you're mostly annoyed at Darnay and Lucy's antics. Yeah, I mean, appreciate it more now. Yeah, what's the thing? It's like, you've got to have some characters that make questionable decisions otherwise you don't have any kind of um uh conflict in in a story you've got to have you've got to have some some level of oh dear someone's made a bad choice here someone needs to fix this um but yes they are not they don't they, yeah they're not the best when it comes to common sense um you feel you should go back to well others now. This is the only one I remember enjoying, but you read them all a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I mean... The thing about Dickens being wordy, he does it for a reason. He stops to point out details and really make you understand what's going on. Exactly, yes. He's very, very observant. That's one thing I love about Dickens. He's very observant. He, not just like physically like observant of stuff around him, he's observant of people and human nature and what a crowd does and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He's a very, very observant guy. You found Great Expectations a real chore. I don't particularly like Great Expectations. It's my least favourite Dickens. Um, and maybe that's because it's kind of the one that everybody says, oh, you should read. But I don't think it's his best work. I really don't. I think it's a little bit too, I don't know, convenient in places. Um, it's a little too convenient and something of a letdown. Uh, nice. Um, yeah, it's, and the characters, just in general, the characters aren't great. And Estelle is a just, oh, 
God, Estella Miss Havisham, just, oh my goodness me. Just all, all the annoyances. Like, let's not just have all the women be awful, please. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I would recommend, uh, even, the problem is, this is one of the shorter ones <laughs> of his novels. Um, if you want a shorter, even shorter one, that technically hasn't actually been finished, but I think is one of Dickens' best works because of the atmosphere he gets in it. It's so well written. It's the mystery of, Edri <coughs> of Edwin Drood. Um, obviously, he died before he could finish it. But because it was his last thing that he wrote, there is there is very much that kind of fully mature Dickens, <laughs> as, as it were, um, writing style of like, I'm just going to... I'm just gonna have I'm just gonna have fun with words and atmosphere and things. So um, Great Expectations is a lot more pessimistic and muddled as far as themes. Yeah, yeah, it feels a bit sort of messy. Um, could have done with a bit of editing, I feel. But yeah, Mystery of Edwin Drood for a shorter read, I would strongly recommend. Um, and then the classic longer ones. I mean, David Copperfield is a banger. It's great, and again, very good for. Um, well, not lots of like strong female characters, but flipping, uh, what's her face? Betsy Trotwood, legend, absolute legend. Best character, possibly the best character in a Dickens book. She's great. Um, uh, Nicholas Nickleby, another good one. Very good. Oliver Twist, yeah, I mean, it is good. Um, slight, I mean, yeah, slight. Uh, problems there with um you know Fagin as a character but you know um story wise it's pretty good of someone unspellable Edwin Drood it is literally how it sounds so Edwin I'm gonna type it I bet Sam's looking at my bookshelf to see if he can see it yep that um the Mystery of Edwin Drood. It's probably, usually you'll find it like in, in a book that's got like that and um, some of Dickens' like shorter stories as well. Um, because obviously, yeah, not, not really a full novel length. Um, wasn't expected such a strong response to Great Expectations. Yeah. <laughs> Primary reason you can't stomach Tolstoy. Let's not all the women be so awful, please. Oh, really? Oh, I, haven't re I don't think I've read any Tolstoy. Um... But, uh, but yeah, just, just Dickens is great. Barnaby Rudge, not so good. Oh, Bleak House is good. Bleak House is fun. A little bit too convenient in places at the end. Um, Bleak House begins with basically Dickens going, ooh, there's a thing going on now, which is like this random, like spooky happening that's happening all apparently all across London of, of spontaneous combustion. How can I write that into a story? And then it becomes literally like the intro and then nothing else. It's like, you're not going to do any kind of mystery with that? No, it just happens. It's just, it's just a manner of death. Okay, sure. Let's have a completely different story that's got nothing to do with the spontaneous combustion. Um, which is quite fun. Uh, mutual friend, mutual friends, all right. Dombey and Son's quite fun. Little Dorrit, oh, Little Dorrit is nicely written. I cannot stand the character of Little Dorrit. She's she's a bit like, um, oh God, what's she a bit like? Well, she's a bit like Lucy actually in this. Um, she's a bit too, I'm so perfect and lovely and I'm so delightful to everybody but hardships just keep happening to me and I'm just such a charitable girl. I was like, please, stop it. Just, yeah. I was like, she's a, she's a, a tender little flower. But, um. Victorian ingenue syndrome. Exactly. That kind of a character is icky. Agreed. Yeah, so it's 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 all that I just ugh, yeah. I forced myself to read Little Dorrit. Um But yeah, oh there are a lot of Dickens you won't have read. Manic Pixie Victorian Girl, precisely that. Love it. Um yeah, there are many, many, many Dickens books. Um lots of Dickens stories that you won't have heard of. Um yeah. 
some are some are better than others. Martin Chuzzlewit's quite fun, mainly because the name is amazing. Martin Chuzzlewit is a good one. Um, yeah, uh, they've all got good characters. That's the thing. Um, they've all got they've all got excellent characters in them. Barnaby Rudge. Barnaby Rudge is, is one of his earlier ones, and uh, I can see what he was doing. I can see what he was trying for, but it's it's a classic sort of Victorian approach to a character with um, learning difficulties, basically. Um, and unfortunately, in the Victorian era, those like anyone with any kind of yeah learning difficulties would just be called an idiot not in a kind of your stupid sense but in sort of like yeah like your yeah an, an idiot was a, like someone with sort of a, like a, a younger mental age necess than they necessarily had and it's all like oh why is this this really shouldn't have turned into the insult that it has so um yeah um that's yeah, that's not great but he i mean he tries this is the thing he does try um but um yeah it's not particularly well written that one either it's a bit of a, a bit of a long one oh, but it is quite fun for dickens rants about society that that's quite a good one for dickens goes on a bit of a tangent and talks about how crap society is and how um yeah but he he's very that's about the um there were riots in London between Catholics and Protestants, um, and I can't remember what camp Camp Dickens was in. Probably Protestant, which is very obvious in that. So um, it's a little bit of bias in that one. Um, but yeah, like if if this has made any of you go, "Ha, huh, Dickens is actually really quite cool," then yeah, go and I mean, they're like. Go to a second-hand bookshop if there are any second-hand bookshops near you, or go online and like go to go to um, was it Better World Books um, that Sam gets a lot of well we both get a lot of our um, books from for this, um, and there will be Dickens because everybody ha well not everybody but a lot of people have a collection of Dickens, um, so yeah just find find some Dickens. And read it because it's great and fun and it's the kind of thing that you can kind of dip in and out of a little bit um, but you do need to kind of remember some of the characters because there are a lot of characters will it make you want to dig up a skeleton and hurl him in the book out of the window oh what Barnaby Rudge probably yeah um, but again it's one of those ones it's just like I feel like he was he was he was go he was writing it with the right attitude like the character Barnaby Rudge is sort of is the hero, um, but unfortunately he is the in quotation marks idiot, and it's like, oh, you tried so hard to like, yeah, write basically write a book about someone who is automatically kind of like judged by society, but is a good person and is kind of yeah has a really tough time because of the the way society acts around them and to them um and it's yeah so it, it, it's it's almost there it's almost there and i can understand like the the thought process that might have gone behind it um i might be giving him too much credit you tried sticker vibes yeah maybe not quite you tried but like and obviously you have to take it in the context of the time blah 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 blah, blah. but um but yeah it's a bit like uh, you struggle to remember names in or out of fiction so dipping in and out is a problem yeah sometimes with dickens sometimes with dickens books if you get like nice ones i think mine have them let's just check yes they have a list of characters in the front <laughs> more books would have character lists in the front if you get a good a good thing of dickens uh yeah you actually have that characters sydney carton a london barrister an able but idle man and a jackal to mr striver so it's all all written and um yeah you get a little bit of a um a blurb about each one which is really really handy 
um, it depends on yeah it depends on what you get if you get an old because I think the ones I've got where are they I think these are reprinted in first issue of this edition February 1907 reprinted November 1910 so this is this is quite an old book this one um, but um, yeah if you if you try and find a second hand like old second hand ones they more often than not will have a list of characters in them which is super helpful you finished reading 100 years of solitary recently it took you ages and there's like 100 characters and 90 of them so share three names oh my god that sounds like hell luckily your count of monte cristo had a name list or you'd never have managed oh nice i don't think mine did but yeah that's handy spark notes often has character lists on their website for classic books oh that's convenient that's good to know um but yeah, I mean, again, Dickens obviously had to because um, all of his books were done in episodes in newspapers and stuff. So people needed to remember like monthly, monthly episodes of Forgot the Characters in a month. So uh, you have a book recommendation. Fire away, Thunder. There's a family tree in the front of the book to help. Have to flip, flip back to its cons. Oh, OK, that's handy. X-ray on Kindle that you use. Oh, Neat. Well, that's very cool. Yeah. What? What should? I mean, if you want to put a put a book recommendation, it's probably best actually, Thunder, to chuck it in the Discord, um, just because this obviously Twitch chat will disappear in a bit. But um, yeah, bung bung it in stream footnotes or something on our Discord. Um, the Ghost by Antonia Barber. Let's go. The Amazing Mister Blunden. That's a great name. That's fantastic. Yeah. If you yeah pop it there too, that'd be great. Thank you, Thunder. We shall have to have a look at that. But yes, I hope you all enjoyed that. I certainly did. You're already pressed send, no worries. Um, way, way past your bedtime. Oh, well, go to bed, get rest. Thank you for popping in, Kat. Lovely to see you. And yeah, good night to you too. Um, but yeah, Dickens is cool. I hope I've converted some of you who didn't like Dickens to Dickens because he's cool. Um, and maybe for some of you it will may have made you understand why i am how the way i am how the way i am yeah that works um because just you know dickens is great and it, it informs a lot of my writing and speech i think <laughs> probably not intentionally but i think it does uh but let us see not quite converted yet again there Ooh. maybe i'll have to read another dickens soon uh, let us see who's on. I imagine it is probably Stephen. We should probably go to Stephen, shouldn't we? I haven't been to Stephen in a while. Let's go say hello to Stephen, who is playing Jusant. Jusant, I still don't know how to pronounce it. Um, which is a game that came out yesterday, I think? Or, yep, something like that. Um, which is a cool game that uh, is also on Game Pass. It's on Game Pass. Um, but yes... Go Jusant, maybe. I like I I, I like that pronunciation. <laughs> Juicy ants, no. Um, but yes, I shall throw us. It is indeed a chill game about climbing. I shall throw us onto uh, Stephen's raid. Uh, Stephen's raid. Stephen's channel. So, thank you all very much for being here. You're all wonderful people. Um, unfortunately, no stream on Saturday, but we should be back next Wednesday with. St short stories from me and Sam will be starting something who knows um, uh, come back next week for that but yes go take care of yourselves and everyone around you and uh, we shall see you very soon goodbye <laughs>